Amen. This is going to be a great week. Stand with me this morning. We're going to prepare to open up the word of the Lord. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. While you're turning there, it's going to be a great week. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, come early. Come early. I tell you what, we actually are anticipating great, great numbers. If you can help us, I'd like to see a show of hands of people that can park off-site at the, our designated parking lot. Is there some people that will help me? Able-bodied people, we can shuttle you. I need to see some hands of people that will park off-site and say, I will do it, Brother Urshan. All right, we're going to be talking to some more people. There's going to be many more people coming tonight. Um, but we'll have, if you're young, if you're able, and if you're a little older and you are got more life than some of these young ones. I know some people here that are 70 that run circles around 30-year-olds. Just saying. I see you, Sister Pauletta. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look at verse 17. There are some 60-year-olds that are full of life. Amen, and I love every one of them. We're going to have a great week. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Everybody say new creature. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I'm going to take this portion of scripture and I'm going to talk about prophecy this morning. I'm going to talk about creatures because we're supposed to be a new creature. Will y'all give me some time to just dig down into it? Anybody tired of this old world? The craziness, the insanity of it? God's got something better for us. And today I want to talk to you about the new creature. The new creature. God bless you. You can be seated. I'm going to read two portions of scripture at the outset of today. How many have ever read prophecy and when you got done, you scratched your head and said, I don't know what in the world that means. There are people who read the book of Ezekiel. They read the book of Daniel. And they say to themselves, you know what? It'll all work out. Let me just love Jesus. And give my tithe and live holy and hopefully I make it. <laughs> well, thank the Lord for your determination. But maybe we can take a closer look this morning. Because God put it in there for a reason. Let me give you an example of one of these odd passages. Ezekiel chapter 1. It's the first time we read about Ezekiel. He is a priest He's in the Cal land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar. And the hand of the Lord is upon him. Verse 4 of Ezekiel 1. This is what he saw. And I looked and behold. 
See, I like that word behold. Let me, let me, before I launch into that. The Bible said that in 2 Corinthians, that behold, every man is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. Behold means stop what you're doing and look closely. It means don't skate by it. It means to use the colloquialism of Mississippi, looky here. <laughs> it means this is not ordinary. Behold, all things are become new. Here he said, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, literally a tornado. So you got to get that image. You got to, that funnel, that sound. Think of fences being obliterated and sheds being torn apart. I don't think they had fences or sheds, but there was bad stuff happening. Trees are uprooted, and this is a, this is a cataclysmic image. You talk about stress. There are times where you'll go through something in your life that's a close call. Something crazy happens. And your heart rate will get up and it'll stress you out. If you narrowly avoid an accident on the road, you'll swerve out of the way and, oh, Jesus, help us. And God keeps his hand on you. And when you get done, you go, whoo, whoo, let me, let me catch my breath. Ezekiel saw something that is worth talking about. And it was cyclonic, tornadic. It was violent what he was seeing. I want the the violence of the moment to settle on us today. A great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, a brightness was about it, out of the midst thereof, out of, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Everybody say living creatures. Came four living creatures. And this was their appearance. Literally, this is what they look like. He's telling us, guys, you're not going to believe what I saw. This is what this looked like. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces. Four. I've met some two-faced people. But these are four faces. And none of those are here today. That's other places that I met them. But I have met a few. They had four faces. Everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. Meaning they're not deviating. They are true. They are set. They have a very straightforward trajectory and path. Their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Now, when you're talking about prophecy, little details like that, you go, wow, that is so weird. Why would you? And first of all, what kind of a weird picture is this? Every one of them had calf feet. You ever see cow's feet? Here they come, and here's the, now it's, it's a likeness of a man, so this means that he's got a body like a man, two arms, two legs, but his feet are like calf's feet. Now, I'm talking about some weird-looking stuff. Is he on LSD? Is he, has he had some extra mushroom on his pizza? Has he, what are we... What are we seeing here? They sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Let me talk to you for a second about the calf's feet. Of course, this is vivid imagery. These are images that are used to describe things in picture form that have powerful spiritual truths. The calf, the cow, the ox is, is what is known in the Bible as a clean creature. It's different from a pig. It's different from a vulture. You can have confidence eating a calf. 
because what the calf eats is good. The calf is used as a type of sacrifice and, and cleanliness because everything about the life cycle of the calf and the cow is clean to us. It's a clean beast. And the fact that this had straight feet and calves feet matters. When, when, and I'm going to get into more of what that means, but I need to take my time. In essence, what it's saying is these are, these are creatures that walked right. They walked right. Where they put their foot was right. They weren't deviant. You don't have to worry about calves attacking you. It's not in their nature. You're not, you don't have to, nobody has to go out with a gun waiting on predatory calves. A bobcat, yes. A mountain lion, yes. A bear, yes. If they had those kinds of beast feet, it would have a different connotation. But this is not something you have to be afraid of. This is one that walks right before God. I want to walk right before God. And this is a poetic way of describing powerful spiritual strengths. You know, there's a place in the Bible where it says that he makes my feet like hinds feet. And he sets me upon my high places. You ever see the feet of a hind, literally a wild mountain goat? The weirdest looking feet you've ever seen in your life. They are not hooves. Or they're a kind of hoof, but they're not a hoof. They're not hard uh, hooves. They are actually like three toes and they have an opposing toe and they can grab they grab <laughs> it's not like a monkey's feet but it is a kind of a grabbing thing and why, why am i even talking about this this morning <laughs> because the hind was able to climb up into high mountains when predators came after it, it could jump along almost sheer rock faces. You ever seen one of those mountain goats run? You know what I'm talking about. Those mountain goats have been seen. They have been videoed climbing up sheer walls and even walls that tilt backwards. They have still managed to keep their hold and scurry over the edge because of the hind's feet. If you've ever felt like you were about to lose it, but yet you kept holding on, you know what it means to have him make your feet like Heinz feet. If you've ever felt like you were going to fall, but you held on anyway, praise God. There are some days when the finances are so bad that you just want to give up. The kids are screaming so much, you're about to lose your mind. Your husband has found your last nerve and is playing jump rope with it. Your wife just doesn't get it. The roof got a leak. The car got a flat tire. And you feel like you're about to fall off that cliff. That's when you hold on anyway. That's when you hang on anyway. That's when you trust God Anyway, when everything's going up in flames, you say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean that in a profound way this morning. I, I went to Fort Myers, Florida this last week. I preached a conference in Orlando. I preached one in Seattle, Washington. On my way to... Orlando, I stopped in Fort Myers to see an old friend. And if you're watching today, old friend, I love you. And God's got his hand on you. They put him in hospice. And I hadn't seen him in a long time. I, I watched this man over the course of two decades overcome kidney problems. They had to remove his kidneys. He lived on dialysis for over 10 years and they took the kidneys out he lived on that machine three times a week he would go in if you've never seen somebody come home from dialysis then you you don't understand suffering where they take all the blood out of your body run it through a machine clean it and then pump it back into your body 
And he would have that dialysis on Tuesday morning. And Tuesday night, he would be on the front row of the church, clapping his hands, raising his hands, lifting his voice, giving praise to God. I watched him do it year after year after year. I'm talking about hanging on. I'm talking about the kind of feet that you have that allow you to, when you don't want to walk anymore, you keep on walking anyway. You keep on coming to church anyway. Straight feet. You ever read where you make straight paths for your feet? I want straight feet. I want the kind of feet that keep on anyway. You don't know what I've been through, Brother Urshan. Keep on anyway. You don't know what happened to that. Keep on anyway. You don't know what they said to me. Keep on, keep on. They had calves feet and they were straight feet and they kept on walking and they were creatures. He got a kidney. He got a kidney. I remember when he got that kid. First of all, they got a kidney and the kidney died. If you've never been on that roller coaster, you don't know how that can jerk you back and forth. The doctor says, come in, we got it. And you get there and you say, no, no, you can't. I'm sorry, go back home. They prep you for surgery. They, they, they get it ready. You got to be there on a moment's notice because the kidney has a limited shelf life. Come on, it's a two and a half hour ride to Tampa and you gotta get in the car and the car can't break down and you gotta get there. And when you get there, they say, I'm sorry, it died. Go back home. And so after a decade, you get back in your car and you go home and you get back in your dark apartment. I'm just talking about hanging on at the outset of this morning. I came to tell somebody, hang on. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. He got his kidney. It came. He got on immunosuppressive drugs. He's a dear friend. He's a great man. He learned more about kidneys than some kidney doctors. <laughs> he knew about potassium levels. He knew about creatine levels. He knew about all the different trace minerals that had to be there. His diet was down to a science. He carefully monitored his intake. And for years, he lived uh, this way. Probably two years, he was able to live a good life. And, and then COVID hit. And the immunosuppressive drugs that were in him wouldn't allow him to fight off COVID. So he did not see a human being for almost two years barely saw anybody because he, he, he had no ability to fight off COVID and there was no vaccine and, and, and COVID would immediately attack that kidney and his body didn't have the wherewithal to fight it off. So he sits in that apartment and he, he watches church and he would come to Durham FPC online and worship God with us online. <laughs> COVID ends, he's able to come out he goes to the doctor to, to get a test done for some hernia repair. And in the MRI, they find a growth on his liver. And they found out that the same thing that killed his kidney was now killing his liver and he had weeks to live. It was too late. The cancer was all through his body. He called me. I've watched this for 20 years now. I watched somebody hang on, hang on. And so... I landed in South Florida. I went to the hospital and I went to see my friend. When I walked in, he had lost a lot of weight, but he was sitting up straight and his eyes were bright. He said, they told me I got a couple days left to live, Brother Urshan, but if these are the last couple days, I'm gonna live them to the best of my ability. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out praising God. I'm trying to describe to you what it means to hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It doesn't matter what life throws your way, hold on. The doctor's report is not the end of the story. Hold on, amen. Stand, having your loins girt about with truth. Stand in the 
liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, stand. And then after having done all, he said, stand. Keep on living for God. Keep on praising God. Keep on magnifying God because you hold on until he comes for you. So when it talks about calf's feet and it talks about hind's feet and he makes my feet like hind's feet, there's a lot in there that relates to me right now. They had the hands of a man under their wings, verse eight. They, they had four faces and wings. Their wings were joined one to another. Verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, all four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. I mean, look at this. What am I, well, how could you even, that's like a nightmare. You wake up with that thing at the end of your bed. <laughs> and Ezekiel said, I saw these things. Look at this. Let me try to describe to you. And here we are, modern people, we go skipping and jumping past this verse in Ezekiel chapter one. This is the chapter that we get the phrase, the wheel in the middle of the wheel. It comes from Ezekiel trying to describe it. I'm gonna take a couple minutes and I'm just gonna unpack some of it because the Bible says we're to be a new creature. Ezekiel said, I saw creatures. We see some more creatures. We find them in the book of Revelation. Let's go to Revelation. I'm, we're not afraid to go to Revelation. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes. Full of eyes. What does that even mean? Full of eyes within full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion. The second like a calf. The third beast had a face like a man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Same dynamics as what Ezekiel saw. Ezekiel's seeing the same thing John is seeing. I'm seeing these amazing beasts. Revelation called them beasts. Ezekiel called them creatures. The four beasts had six wings. They were full of eyes within. They rest not day and night. And you want to know where we get the phrase, holy, holy, holy? Right here. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And those beasts give glo glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne that liveth forever and ever. I'm trying to take a moment this morning to talk to you about creatures. I want to unpack a little bit about what these amazing creatures beings are what are they it's almost like the wizard of oz just comes alive here lions and tigers and bears and people they don't know what those things are what they represent i'm here to tell you they represent powerful powerful truths we are new creatures in christ jesus and maybe now is a good time to tell you this the word beast there that John sees is different than the beasts later that he sees. These creatures that he sees around the throne, it's a different Greek word than the ones he sees coming up out of the sea. The ones coming up out of the sea, it uses the word beast, but it's a different Greek word. In English, it says beast, but it's a different Greek word. The ones that he sees now around the throne, they mean creation. These are beasts that God made. God made the calf. God made the eagle. God made the lion. The book of Job said that, that he gives them their food when they cry out unto God. And he asked Job, don't question me. I've been feeding creation for a long time. Don't question why I do why I do. There's people here today, you don't know why things happened to you the way they did. You don't know why circumstances took the turn that they did. You don't know, and, and I don't have all the answers. 
I have seen the righteous cut down before their time. I have seen the wicked prosper. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes said. I don't know why God does what he does, but I know that he does all things well. God is in control this morning. God is going to have a people. God is going to have a creation. God is going to have a work in the earth. And I am part of it, and so are you. Praise God. These are creatures God made. And the ones that come later are different. They are creatures Different word. That word means malevolent. It means disorder. It means chaos. It means God never put it together like this. This is the world of four-headed leopards. This is the world of, of bears and, and creatures that have different animal parts attached. And, 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 and they represent nations that would rise up out of the earth. They rise up out of the sea. Why beasts? Why beasts? And the reason God uses beasts is their nature tells us something, number one. And number two, man without God is a beast. Amen. W without God, I'm no good. Without God, you are no good. Without the touch of heaven, we are in trouble. God told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, you think you made all of this? I can take your mind from you in a moment. I can take your faculties from you in a moment. I can drive you out from among men. And all the glory of Babylon will be subjected to the things of God. Nebuchadnezzar ate grass like a beast. His fingernails grew long. His hair grew long. By the way, one reason why men cut their hair is because we are not beasts. It is because we are submitted to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And my cut hair is a submission symbol to God. I'm not an animal. I'm not a beast. I am a son of God and I'm made in his image. Praise God. Nebuchadnezzar, his hair grew long like a beast. He ate grass for seven years until seven times passed over him. And the Bible said that that happened that he might know that the heavens do reign. I don't care how bad it gets, how bad Babylon gets, how bad this whole world gets, heaven is in control. Let me say it again, God is in control. Doesn't matter what Russia does, God is in control. Doesn't matter what China does, doesn't matter what the US does, God is in control. He's the King of Kings, He's the Lord of Lords. And I came to testify to you today, He's gonna have a new creature. He's gonna have a new heaven, He's gonna have a new earth, He's gonna have a new Jerusalem, and He's gonna have a new you and a new me. Hallelujah. We're gonna sing a new song, we're gonna have a new life. Oh, what singing. Oh, what shouting. On that happy morning when we all shall rise. I plan on seeing Jesus. So uh, let me deal with these creatures. Because the kind of creatures that are around the throne are different than the kind that are coming up out of the sea. That's just one of the things that's true in prophecy. Different Greek words. I'm not going to talk about the insanity John saw. I'm going to talk about the creatures. I'm going to talk about these amazing creatures that had the face of an ox or in Greek a calf. That had the face of an eagle. That had the face of a lion and the face of a man. One creature had all these faces on it. Four faces. Why, Brother Urshan? The idea here is that this is creation in order. This is creation in order. Every one of those creatures is the master of its domain. God was saying, I'm going to have a, an ordered creation. And it's going to declare my glory. 
I'm going to put things back in order. Praise God. I'm going to make you the best of every part of you. I'm going to enhance you beyond your fallenness. You're going to be a new creature. Hallelujah. Each one of them, the eagle is the master of the air. The lion is the master of the field. The ox, the calf, is the master of agriculture. And the man is the master of the whole thing. It's another way, it's a prophetic way of saying, I'm going to make the best you that there can be. You're not going to lag behind. You're not going to be inferior. But when I get done with you, when you fulfill the potential that I have placed in your life, all creation is going to declare his glory. I, I, I look at you, Brother Godair. I look at my father. I look at men like Pastor Galindo. I look at, I was with Brother Von Morton this last week, Brother Kenbo. I look at men who have walked this earth and have built great things. And I can see in them creatures, new creatures. They know how to roar when it's time to roar. They know how to see far and fly high when it's time to see far and fly high. They know how to put their hand and their shoulder to the plow and push when they need to push. And they know how to exercise dominion over the things of God. And they work in all of those administrations in such a powerful way. Hallelujah. You think churches come into existence by accident? Oh no. You're going to have to have strength. You're going to have to have vision. You're going to have to have the ability to pull a plow. And you're going to have to be a man of God. Hallelujah. If we're going to have revival, I got to be the best I can be. I got to be the best that God made me to be. I've got to step into my fullest capacity. I've got to step into my fullest dominion. God did not make me to fall apart. God made me to reign on this earth. I hope you're with me this morning. Hey, you're talking about cows and eagles. and What are we talking about, brothers? I'm talking about you. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about creation. The Bible said they had eyes before and eyes behind them. I think if we're going to have revival, we've got to be able to see in front of us and we've got to see behind us. Woo. We've got to have vision that sees both directions. I don't ever want to lose the ability to see behind me. Praise God. I sang some songs this morning, and we sang some songs that they come from behind us. They sang some of those songs in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and those songs have great depth. They have great meaning. If you're here today and you're young and maybe the rhythm doesn't appeal to you or maybe the words don't appeal to you, maybe you need to develop some eyes that can see behind you. Maybe, maybe you can realize that this church didn't just pop into existence in 2022, but you gotta look back at 1970 and 1975 and 1980, and there's been a lot of songs and a lot of victory and a lot of power and a lot of preaching. I wanna look back and I wanna see where we came from. I wanna if you don't learn history, you are doomed to repeat history. I plan on having victory in my life, and I can't do it unless I understand where I came from. You better have eyes that can look behind you. If you forget where your grandfather came from, where your father came from, if you forget the trials that the church overcame, then you have no eyes that can see behind you. At the same time, you gotta walk a balancing act because you gotta have eyes that can see in front of you. If every service we had a man with an upright bass fiddle and a woman with an accordion leading worship, today, we might have a little trouble. 
There was a time when the upright bass fiddle was a big deal. Ba-boom, 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 boom, boom. And they'd get to going on that accordion. They'd just saw away on it. <laughs> that was a big deal. I love that kind of music. And I have eyes that can appreciate that kind of music. Now, if you try to bring that in here today for every single service. Now, that was the hottest thing back in 1940. But it's not the hottest thing right now. Now, now, we don't throw it out. We appreciate it, but we have to move forward too. It's not easy. It's not easy because some people, they can only see behind and some people, they can only see before. But you got to be able to see both. I don't plan on losing my grandkids. I don't plan on losing the next generation. I plan on pivoting and I plan on giving honor to every generation that is in this place. We're living in a world of hip hop. We're living in a world of rock. We're living in a world of R&B and rhythm and blues. And if you don't learn to pivot and say, wait a minute, there's got to be a church that can praise God with every facet that they have. A church that can praise God and keep this apostolic doctrine and love God and have revival. It's got to happen both ways. Praise God. There's wonderful things that we're learning how to do. There's things we're learning how to do financially and in business as we look forward. There was a time in my life I didn't know how to do that. Many generations previous to us did not understand business. Now people are learning about business and stewardship. And if we're going to have revival, I think we need to take dominion in every part of that. What do you mean, Brother Urshan? I think you need to buy your house and own it. There are some people that don't know that. They think they need to rent for their entire life. If you rent for your whole life and your biggest goal is to pay the rent man, you've got very backward vision. God doesn't want you to be indebted to another person the rest of your life. God wants to make you the head and not the tail. And let me just say something practical. It's a good time to buy a house if you can buy a house. Because in the next 10 years, things are going to shoot through the roof. The next 12 months is going to be a window for people. I encourage you to do everything you can. S stop buying Starbucks. Learn to brew coffee at home. That $6. Well, I don't have money to buy a house. You had 50 bucks to buy Starbucks last week. 50 times 4 is $200. Put it in the bank account. Let it earn interest. Save it up. Brew your coffee at home and buy a house. Because I want you to rise up on wings. I want you to be able to pull the plow. I want you to have something. My God, somebody needs to help me right now. I'm trying to make you the master of your domain. I'm trying to make it where you rise to the top. Don't sink to the bottom. Hallelujah. I want you to have power on the earth. I want you to be a part of God's creation. I don't want you to be the bobcat. I want you to be the lion. God didn't make you to be a house cat. He made you to be a lion. And that's what these creatures were. It was creation stepping into their full orbed potential. Is this all right? Because I'm just getting started. I got about another hour and a half, two hours left in me. <laughs> Praise God. Be like Brother J.T. Pugh, preach for four hours. <laughs> he said, Brother Pugh got to preach and preach. Was it four hours, brother? Five hours. Five hours. He started at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, and he kept going till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. People left at 1 o'clock to go get lunch, came back. He was still preaching. Now, now don't be afraid. I'm not going to do all that. But whatever I got to do to turn you into the ox, to turn you into the eagle, to turn you into the lion, I'm not raising up weaklings in the gospel. I want to raise up creatures that stand around the throne that say worthy. You're worthy. 
you have redeemed me. You have brought me out. You have set me free. Holy, holy, holy. Which was, which is, and which is to come. And all creation can declare his glory. I'm hoping the calves and the eagles and the calves' feet are making a little more sense. Do you know how far an eagle can see? It's miles. An eagle can be out of sight above in the clouds. It can see a rabbit working its way through the underbrush. It can aerodynamically position its body to shoot down, grab that rabbit before the rabbit even knows what hit it. Claws, tear into it, grab it, and it takes off, and it's game over. Lunchtime. <laughs> I'm talking about having vision. The rabbit has no idea that kind of vision. It's got sharp senses. It's got sharp instincts, but, but there is a vision. There is a vision that's got to happen if the church is gonna become what it's supposed to become. If you don't understand that vision, if you can't see a long way off, you're gonna die. You're gonna live an inferior life. Praise God. You know one of the traits of the patriarchs? You read it, it's over and over and over and over again. The Bible says they lifted up their eyes. They lifted up their eyes and they saw afar off. That's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. It says that, that they saw the promises afar off. It says they were persuaded, that they confessed, and then it says they embraced. Woo. I, could, I could spend the next 45 minutes preaching on those four elements of seeing afar off. Maybe I will. Maybe we'll just turn this into a five-part series. Praise God. They saw, just because you see it doesn't mean you embrace it yet. Amen. It's a good day, the day you see the promises of God. It's a good day when you see the need for things. Praise God. Whew. Had some young people. They were hanging out with some, some very carnal people. People that were involved in porn. People that were involved in worldly music and worldly entertainment. They... They liked sin and drug use and promiscuity. And, and they were, there were some good young people hanging out with them. I said, stop hanging out with them. Don't go around them. Well, that's my friend. I don't care. Stop hanging out with them. Now, that sounds mean in the moment. But, but eagles see a long way off. I'm not looking at this Friday night. I'm looking four years down the road when you're gonna be in that car that gets stopped by the police and they got five pounds of marijuana in the back of the trunk and I'm trying to stop you before this world gets a hold of you and I've got eyes that can see a long way. What fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does the temple of God have with that of Belial? Hallelujah, I can see it coming a mile away. Cut off sin. Cut off ungodly association. Cut off the world. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. And if I'm attracted to something that's deviant, it means there's something wrong with me. And I can see it. Well, I just don't see what the big deal is. Why Brother Godet thinks that's such a big deal? Why Brother Urshan thinks it's such a big deal? That's because we're looking three years down the road. We've seen a hundred people do what you're doing. And you got to have eyes. You got to have eyes. Yeah, they call it eagle eye. <laughs> Amen. I was in the sixth grade, and we had a PE teacher, and we played kickball. And I was on first base, and I like to lead off, get a head start. In kickball, they don't just have to tag you out. They can hit you with a ball, one of them big old bouncy balls. And I was about five feet off of the bag, 
and the PE instructor was headed back to, to roll that ball, and I, had, I was already starting to run, and he palmed that ball, turned around, and pow, hit me right in the head. <laughs> How did you see me? He said, old eagle eye. <laughs> Man, when you get a hold of this word of God, you'll see a long way off. When you get a hold of this scripture, when you let preaching do what it's designed to do, come to church Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night of East Coast Conference. You're going to hear stuff that's going to let you see a decade into the future. You're going to hear things that are going to change everything. You're going you're gonna to hear things that will save you from dysfunctional relationships, save you from broken homes, save you from divorce court, save you from hell. And this creation, it's going to be like that eagle. They saw it afar off. The Bible said that they were persuaded. That, that there's difference, a difference between seeing it and being persuaded by it. There's a lot of people out there. You'll go up to them and say, you know, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. They'll say, yeah, I see it in there. I see it. Yeah, you got a good point. But my church, well, I'm not talking about your church. I'm talking about the Bible. My preacher, I'm not talking about your preacher. I'm talking about the apostle Peter. I don't want the church that John Wesley built. And I don't want the church that Martin Luther built. I don't want the church that Charles Taz Russell built. That's Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't want the church that Joseph Smith built. I don't want the church the Pope built. There's only one church. There's only one church that's gonna make it. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. My church, my church. Make up in your mind to get in the church Jesus built. He called a bullshataya. You get into a tongue talking church. You get into a blood washed church. You get into the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. You get into the innumerable company of angels. You get into the, the blood covenant that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Get in that church because that's the only one that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. Praise God. I don't just see it. I'm persuaded by it. There'll come a time when you look at that and say, the Bible does say that. I can see see it Whoo! it didn't say the father son and holy ghost it said the name of the father son and holy ghost well the father and the son are two different mm -mm, you better look a little closer you got to get persuaded hallelujah the bible said what is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I want to reconcile you back to the dominion God made you to have. I want you to become the ox. I want you to become the eagle. I want you to become the lion. I want you to become the man God made you to be. To become the woman that God made you to be. Stop crawling around in the undergrowth. Stop living like a beast. You've got to become the creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm done with men. I'm done with men. All men are pigs. Well, when they're saddled with lust, they are. When they're deviants, they are. When they're addicted to porn, they are. 
when they're addicted to alcohol and booze and every stimulant you can imagine, they are. They don't walk with a calf's foot, they walk with a pig's foot. Praise God. Man, I wish I had time to talk about that calf. There's a reason why God called the calf part of the pinnacle of his creation, the ox, the calf. The Bible says they chew the cut. I'm way out of my notes. Y'all just going to have to bear with me. They chew the cud, and they have a cloven hoof. So they walk a certain way, and they chew the cud. Mm, mm, mm. Pigs don't do that. They have a cloven hoof, but they don't chew the cud. Help me, God, to unpack this, because this is good. The ox, the cow, the calf, they chew the cud. What does that mean, brother? They say, what do they have, four stomachs? Is it four? Four stomachs. I don't know what to do with one. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to slim down one. Those donuts keep calling, that pasta keeps calling, and it is spiritual warfare of the highest order. They got four, Brother Newton. Four! I feel like I got four sometimes. <laughs> it's just so good, man. They make food so good. I need to stop it. Why does that matter? The Bible says because they chew the cud. They chew the cud. They're a clean creature because they chew the cud. They don't eat dead things. They don't eat garbage. They chew the cud. That means they eat the grass. They're herbivores. They, they eat it. It goes into one stomach, and then they pull it back up. They regurgitate it, and they chew it again, and it goes into another stomach. This is a biochamber system where they continually break down what they're taking in. He Hoshaya. Praise God. God's looking for men and women that know how to start feeding on the good things of God. You need to get that scripture and you need to get it down on the inside of you. That's number one. That's containment number one, chamber number one. But then on Monday, you need to pull it back up again and you need to chew on it a little more and break it down a little finer and it'll go into chamber number two. But you ain't done yet. You pull that back up on Wednesday and you chew it again and you, you get more out of it. You break it down a little more and then you put it in chamber number four. And by the time it's done you're going to realize he's the mighty God in Christ you're going to realize that he's the Father Son and Holy Ghost you're going to realize that it's Deuteronomy 6 4 and it's Acts 2 38 because you know how to chew the cud that'll make you a new creature that'll make you a new creature that'll make you a new creature You need to chew on this message on Monday. You need to chew it on Tuesday. You need to chew it on Friday. Come on. Woo! You ever wonder what a cow's doing out there? It's just sitting there. <laughs> Mouth work, big old, big old muscles. You need some big old chewing muscles if you're going to chew down Deuteronomy 6 4. If you're going to chew up Ezekiel 1, you better get you some chewing muscles. <laughs> Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Brother Urshan, you are out in left field. What are you even talking about? I'm talking about chewing the cud. Let me, let me, let me put it into the spirit word that it is. Meditate. Meditate. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sinners, sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight... Is in the law of the Lord. And in this law doth he meditate 
day and night. You can't do that if you're addicted to a television. You can't do that. If you're addicted to television in Hollywood, you're going to get porn and homosexuality and LGBTQ and carnal thinking and wickedness. But if you can delight yourself in the law of the Lord and you pull it up again, chew on it. Put it in the second container. Chew on it. Pull it up again and keep on processing it. What comes out of it is going to be power. What comes out of it is going to be dynamic. What comes out of it is going to be the Word of God. And in this law doth he meditate day and night. When I meditate like that, my foot goes where it's supposed to go. I've got calves' feet. Pigs are not like that. Pigs are not like that. Pigs also have a cloven foot, and they look like they're walking right but they eat garbage. What they're feeding on doesn't translate to where they put their feet. These are people that are chewing on the wicked stuff. These are people that delight in the dead stuff. These are the, the cow on the inside is clean and where he puts his feet is clean. But the pig is filth on the inside, but he looks like he's walking right. God hates hypocrisy. When on the outside it looks like you're walking one way, but on the inside you're full of wickedness. That's not a calf, that's a pig. When you're chewing on things that are vile, when you're chewing on things that are abominable, it even tastes good. You ever have bacon? You ever have a bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwich? <laughs> now, listen, folks. I love the New Testament. I, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused to be received with thanksgiving and prayer. Thank the Lord. <laughs> I'm not trying to get into Jewish dietary law here, but I am saying that wickedness has a flavor. And I've got to match what I'm walking with what I'm eating. One is clean. One is not clean. This is why God wants you to become that creature. I want to walk the way I'm walking. The way I say I'm walking. I don't want to preach this on Sunday and live another way on Monday. Praise God. What does your husband think of your walk with God? What does your wife think of your walk with God? You know, the people that live with you every day. Oh, you sure don't talk like that at church. At church, everybody thinks you're a goody two-shoes, but when you get home, you're a monster. Make sure you're walking the same way that you are at all times. What do your employers think of you? Shouting Jesus, hallelujah, on Sunday and walk in 30 minutes late every time to work. Do the minimum amount of work. Look down on everybody because I'm holier than you are. Steal, lie, connive, gossip, but I still love Jesus. Be careful that you don't walk one way and you're a different way inside. God didn't raise pigs. God raised calves. Hallelujah. God needs somebody that can meditate on his word. God needs somebody that can meditate on preaching. Meditate. Sometimes my wife will come out, and I'll be out there with a cup of coffee in my hand. And my eyes are closed, and I've got the fireplace going, and I'm thinking about psalms. And she'll go, what are you doing? And in my mind, I'm going, I'm chewing the cud. I was on the airplane the other day, and I, 
I was waiting on them all to load, and I had my head back, and I was thinking about the book of Galatians, and something shot like a lightning bolt across my mind, and it, it was everything in me not to jump up and go, ah, oh, hallelujah! I had just pulled it back up and put it in another chamber. I found something I'd never seen before. I found something I'd never noticed before. How do you learn that, Brother Urshan? You chew the cud. You meditate. You, you think upon it. You give yourself continually to these things. That thy profiting may appear to all. My sons have to know that I love his word. My wife has to know that I love his word. I've got to be a Christian on Tuesday as well as Sunday. I'm running out of time. That calf becomes an ox. That ox can pull that plow. God wants people that know how to work. You can't build a church on slackers. You can't build a church on people who are just casually interested. You've got to have committed people. You got to have people that will allow a yoke to be put upon their shoulders. Just because we serve God doesn't mean we don't have a yoke. His yoke is easy, but it is a yoke. Listen, serving God is easy. Somebody came to me and said, boy, this living for God is hard. No, it's not hard. It's only hard if you do it halfway. But if you give all you've got, his yoke is easy. If you want an easy yoke, don't date outside the church. If you want an easy yoke, don't marry outside the kingdom of God. If you want to plow a straight line, do not yoke yourself to somebody that wants to go that way. Because you're going to pull back that way. And they're going to pull back that way. And when you get done and look back at the furrow you've plowed, you're going to have chaos. And you're going to need a lot of marriage counseling. But if you can grab a hold of somebody that wants to plow straight, if you can grab a hold of somebody whose feet are straight, if you can grab a hold of somebody that has calves' feet, Hallelujah. Feet that go where they're supposed to go. Pe people that want to serve God. People that love the things of God. You're going to find out you can plow a straight furrow. What do you mean, Brother Urshan? I mean your children will grow up in that peaceful environment. The yoke means that sometimes they'll pull a bit, sometimes you'll pull a bit, but it's basically straight. My wife and I aren't the same person, but we are yoked and we're pulling. And she helps me. And I help her. My wife helps me see things I can't see. She'll, she's got eagle eyes. She'll say, watch out. Careful with that. I saw this, that, and the other. And I'll say, thank you, baby. And I help pull the plow. And we work together. It's a yoke. It's an equal yoke. You think that you want somebody that's exotic until you got to live with them. And sometimes exotic is just another word for rebellious. Oh, they're so different. Let me grab a hold of them. They're everything I always wanted. They make me feel so alive. That lasts for about three months. And then exotic becomes crazy. You're not exotic. You're a nut. How about you just work a job? How about that? <laughs> Man, they'll exotic their way and sleep till noon. <laughs> Ain't exotic no more, is it? Man, you got to find somebody that knows how to pull that plow. Find somebody that knows that you got to get the kids to church. Get them to the house of God. Hallelujah. Somebody that when, when you're both tired, that you're not going to say, you know, let's just lay out of church. Let's say the kids are sick. Uh, 
There were times where the kids were sick. It didn't mean both of us had to stay home. I'll just throw that out there. I want somebody that's going to pull right alongside me. When I'm feeling a little down, that they'll go, come on. When they're feeling a little down, I say, come on. Let's go to the house of God. Because if I get in an unequal yoke, I can't pull that plow. Seed can't be put into the ground. I can't reap a harvest. I'm closing. Musicians can come. I, I'm not even halfway through. We'll have to pick it up another time. But, but this, this calf, this ox, is also acquainted with sacrifice. The Bible says that when David received the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines sent it on a cart, an ox cart. There's a lot of powerful material in that, but those, those oxen, they pulled, those cows pulled that Ark of the Covenant. It takes, it takes beasts of burden to pull the presence of God to pull the church, to pull into the future, to pull a plow, to do the work of God. And that's exactly what happened. And when they got to the end of the journey, the Bible says that they came to the house of Obed-Edom and they offered a sacrifice and they sacrificed those cows. A lot of times after you've pulled and done everything you can, there's sacrifice waiting on you at the end. But if it's for the glory of God, but the goat area, if people knew the sacrifices you made, people don't know. And you can't tell everybody because you just sound like you're whining. And you're not. But people that say, it's not about me, it's about him. People that say, I'll give my life, I'll pull this plow. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. These creatures, they're going to have these traits. They're going to walk like this. They're going to have this nature. And at the end of my life, when I've gone all the way, I give my life. What did Paul think when they pulled him up in front of that executioner? He has built Ephesus. He has built Philippi. He has built Galatia. He has built Thessalonica. He has built Smyrna and Thyatira. He has built all of these churches. And now at the end, there's a man with an ax. I pulled it all this way. And this is how it ends. History says he jerked free from his jailers and ran and put his neck on the block. I'm just saying that you got to understand sacrifice if you're going to be part of this creature. There's things that you'll do that nobody ever knows. There's things that moms and dads do that nobody ever knows. There's links you will go to to make sure people are serving God. To make sure the lights stay on. To make sure the doors stay open. To make sure the bills are paid. To make sure, to make sure you put your hand to that plow. You put your shoulder to the wheel and you push. This is my creation. I know a lot of men that walk away from the plow. They walk away from the woman. They walk away from the kids. That's too much. It's too much. I got to go do my thing. You're not an ox. You're a waste. Society can't make it if somebody won't let that yoke be put on their shoulders. Somebody's got to raise those boys. Somebody's got to raise those children. Don't you leave it up to grandma. Don't you leave it up to grandpa. You let them put that yoke on your shoulders. If you're man enough to get in bed, be man enough to raise them. Be woman enough. Let's stand in the presence of God. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creature. And I walk like this and I stand before his throne it doesn't mean me as a person it means creation that's put back in order it means men and women that exhibit these traits men and women that can see before them and behind them men and women that will walk straight they have strength they know how to sacrifice 
I haven't even got to the lion. I haven't even got to the man. I'm out of time. I'm just saying we're new creatures. These are the creatures. This is the creation. It's not the beasts that come later. It's the creation of God in the earth. And when you do it, and you do it right, you give glory to him. Praise God. You give glory to the one that sits on the throne. Somebody came up to me one time. They said, Man, I just feel better when I'm with you, Brother Urshan. I love you. And they didn't even know me. Not really. Sister Urshan knows me and she still loves me. Thank the Lord. <laughs> but what they were really saying is I love the Jesus that I feel in you. I love that you walk straight. I love that you pull the plow. I love that you see far. I love, I love these traits that are part of that creation because it gives glory to God. Let's lift our hands in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't need to eat garbage. You need to chew the cud. You don't, you don't need the garbage of this world. You need to meditate upon the things of God. This is my creation. I'm going to raise up men that look like this. I'm going to raise up women that look like this. I'm going to raise up families that are like this. I'm going to open this altar. I want somebody to come. I want, I want some of this new creation to come down here and stand before his throne and say, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy.